Thank you everyone for sticking around. Um, I wanted to preface our conversation with um, a slight disclaimer at the top. I know that there is a lot of interest in some uh, news events of the day. Uh, however, <laughs> um, this conversation is going to stay focused on the Department of Justice's approach to data and technology policy. Is there something else going on? <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing else more important than that. <laughs> um, so Deputy Attorney General Rosenstein is going to uh, stick to talking about those topics um, that he can discuss. So uh, with that, I thought I'd open it with a, an issue that everyone in this room has talked about a lot and is very familiar with um, on encryption. Uh, in a recent speech, you talked about your support for what you called responsible encryption um, and the ability of um, the couple secure encryption with the ability of government to access that information when needed. Uh, but you also don't want the government to micromanage the engineering of technologies. Uh, can you maybe uh, start us off by elaborating on how you see striking the balance of privacy and public safety? Absolutely. You know, I fully appreciate the perspective that uh, so many privacy advocates have. And of course, from a law enforcement perspective as well, maintaining confidentiality of information, uh, electronic information, is really important to us. Uh, the more we are able to secure information, the less uh, likely we are to have fraud cases and other criminal referrals. Uh, so encryption is really critical to data security. But I also uh, see the law enforcement problems that are raised by uh, encryption. Just give you a sense of what I experienced. Uh, before I took this job, I served as US Attorney in Maryland. Uh, and we had a number of cases increasingly that arose over my tenure from 2005 uh, to 2017, in which data was inaccessible to law enforcement, uh, but was probative of criminal activity, and in some cases even uh, represented criminal activity in and of itself. And so uh, the point of the term that we use for what we're seeking, responsible encryption, is that yes, we favor encryption, but not encryption to the exclusion of legitimate law enforcement concerns. And so I think uh, it's important for everybody involved in this debate uh, to recognize that there is something on the other side of the balance, that if you have uh, encrypted communications that are completely protected from detection by law enforcement, even with a legitimate law enforcement reason, even with probable cause, even with a, a court order or a warrant, uh, then you're going to be allowing criminal activity to occur without the ability of law enforcement to intervene. Uh, and so the term responsible encryption is intended to capture uh, the need for a balance, that is, encryption that protects information from being accessed improperly for criminal purposes, but responsible in the sense that it remains available to law enforcement with a legitimate need uh, ordered by a court. And with the proliferation of location data and internet connected devices, uh, some have said that we're in the golden age of surveillance when it comes to what, the law, what law enforcement does have access to. Would you, how would you respond to that? Uh, I'm not sure what they mean by golden age of surveillance. We certainly have more surveillance than we have in the past. We'll probably have more in the future in the sense that you describe it, you know, people protecting themselves with uh, cameras and surveillance systems and that sort of thing. Uh, and so you know, some people say, well, there's so much uh, surveillance technology that it overrides the need for responsible encryption. That is, overrides the need for law enforcement to obtain access to encrypted devices. I think those are two totally different issues. It's true that uh, the availability of surveillance uh, does enable us to solve crimes we m might not have been able to solve in previous uh, eras. And so, yes, uh, surveillance technology can be a valuable law enforcement tool, but there are still going to be circumstances where uh, unless we're able to get access to encrypted devices, we're not going to have the evidence of a crime. Think about child pornography. Uh, for example, you may have surveillance to prove somebody was at a particular place at a particular time, but if you don't have access to the device that has the photographs, you're not going to have the evidence uh, of the crime itself. Or imagine that you're conducting an investigation of a violent criminal organization that uh, is engaging in ongoing crimes of violence, and you have a lawful court order to intercept communications of that gang, and if you can intercept them, you actually might be able to save a life, but if the communications are encrypted, you're not going to know what they're planning, and you won't be there in time uh, to prevent that crime. And so, uh, yes, it's certainly true that surveillance technologies do enhance law enforcement's ability to uh, detect crime, uh, but nonetheless, it's not a substitute for the ability to obtain access to devices that contain evidence of criminal activity. So what would your advice be to the largest technology companies out there who say they're trying to protect their 
consumers' privacy and have a responsibility to do so, uh, but also want to don't want to obstruct the law enforcement's efforts. They're in a tough spot. What would what do you think that they should do? What's your advice to them? Well, what we're asking uh, technology companies to do is to uh, consider the balance uh, of not only the need for encryption, which should be as uh, secure as possible, but consistent with uh, the need with a lawful court order to get into the devices. And so uh, that's really all we're saying is that there ought to be something else on the other side of the balance. And I fully appreciate the position that uh, many technology companies are in. Uh, you know, they're in a competitive business environment. And if the competition is for whose devices are more secure against court orders, uh, then it's going to be very difficult for you to weigh the interest in law enforcement. Uh, but we think that the desire to uh, promote good law enforcement, the desire to prevent your devices from being misused to promote criminal activity uh, is a legitimate factor for companies to consider in engineering their devices. You know, it wasn't that long ago that uh, responsible access was engineered into operating systems uh, for most devices. There are still uh, some in which it is. Uh, we think that the movement toward law enforcement proof encryption uh, is actually going to be harmful to the long-term interests of law enforcement uh, and of the citizens. I wanted to shift gears uh, to one of the, the biggest buzzwords that we are talking about these days, uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, the largest illegal Bitcoin exchange, BTCE, was taken down by law enforcement last year mm -hmm. and after it received about, what, four billion worth of Bitcoin, most of it money laundered in some way uh, from ransomware attacks or identity theft theme, uh, schemes. What is the biggest hurdle that law enforcement faces when it comes to the rise of cryptocurrencies? Well, obviously, you know, cryptocurrencies serve some legitimate objectives, but you know, like most emerging technologies, uh, criminals are often the first to jump on the bandwagon. So criminals see cryptocurrencies as an opportunity to move money. Uh, without the ability to be detected and therefore to protect proceeds of money laundering activities. Uh, and so criminals are essentially first adopters uh, of these cryptocurrencies. And so while there may be legitimate uses, uh, and there's certainly many people who uh, engage in transactions with electronic currencies, uh, the challenge that we face is that uh, the ability to follow the money is really critical to prevent a lot of crime, you know, crimes that are directed toward earning profits. Uh, and so we've seen in these cases, uh, uh, the one that you mentioned and others, uh, that people are using these cryptocurrency technologies uh, to commit crimes, to extort money uh, through means which they believe will not be traceable, uh, and then to launder that money so that they can uh, shift it uh, into accounts or into places that they can take advantage of it. And so that's the biggest challenge we face with cryptocurrency. If it's not going through legitimate financial institutions, uh, we're going to have difficulty tracking it uh, and identifying crimes. Uh, also, uh, you know, it provides an opportunity for criminals to conceal income from taxation, which is, of course, another legitimate function of government. Uh, and so it does pose challenges for us that uh, I think we're just really coming to terms with. You know, this is only a problem that's emerged over the last few years uh, in widespread use, uh, and it's something that uh, we're going to need to come to terms with. How is the Justice Department trying to keep up with the, how fast this area is moving? And the, the amount of growth it's seen in the past year alone has been probably surprising to almost all of us. <laughs> right. Well, well, one of the challenges is just keeping abreast of the technology. And so we, you know, we do have experts uh, in the FBI and in the Department of Justice in our criminal division, as well as uh, points of contact within each of our 94 U.S. Attorney's offices, uh, because we need people to keep up with the emerging technology. Yeah, these are things that uh, we didn't learn in law school, literally, because it didn't exist when many of us were in law school. Uh, and uh, so it really does require uh, a focused effort by the Justice Department, the FBI, and other federal agencies to make sure that we're hiring people with the right expertise and that we're providing the appropriate training so that we're keeping up on emerging technologies and we have a sense of where the vulnerabilities are. Um, and I wanted to ask one more question before we open it up to some audience questions um, before we wrap up. Um, turning to data storage overseas uh, and the Microsoft case in the Supreme Court, uh, which is watched by pretty much every uh, technology company that's doing business around the world, uh, the case will determine basically what law enforcement needs to do to retrieve digital evidence on foreign servers. And there's a debate about whether this, best, this is best resolved in the courts or by Congress. How do you think we can finally get to uh, a solution to this pretty complicated problem? I think uh, both might be ways to resolve it. 
uh, as you know, we're challenging uh, judicially the adverse decision out of the Second Circuit, I believe it was. Uh, and there are also proposals for legislative fixes. And this is an area actually where I believe to a large extent the interests of law enforcement and the technology sector uh, are aligned. That is, our technology companies have an interest in knowing what the rules are, uh, what they can and can't do with regard to foreign stored data. Uh, and when they're required to comply with subpoenas. So I think this is an area where, to the extent that there's a legislative solution, uh, there really are opportunities for us to work together with the technology industry uh, to make sure that we arrive at a solution that's going to be most efficient uh, and uh, will save everybody having to litigate this issue over and over again. Uh, Senator Hatch has offered some legislation to this effect or in this realm. Do you support that? Are there legislative vehicles out there that you think would be effective? solutions? There are proposals that we're considering within the department. Uh, I'm not going to make any commitment to that one in particular, um, but I do think that uh, uh, legislation is often uh, an effective way to resolve uh, these issues when there are challenging uh, technological developments uh, that really uh, weren't considered when early legislation was passed. That's one of the issues we face with regard to many of these uh, judicial battles is that we're applying statutes uh, to novel technologies. and. You know, new legislation that account, counts for emerging technologies uh, makes it much easier for us all. What would you say is the department's biggest challenge and what is the biggest threat when it comes to protecting the digital economy? Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> it's you know, the biggest threat, as you all recognize, is the threat of cyber hacking and intrusions. Uh, you all have to deal with that on a daily basis. Uh, as you know, our federal agencies are very much engaged. Uh, working on their own and working in coordination with industry to combat uh, these threats. Some of them are from foreign state actors, uh, espionage efforts. Some of them are commercial uh, hacking efforts. Some of them are criminals who are out to extract ransom or extort uh, corporations. Uh, but uh, that's the biggest challenge we face is that we need to you know, continue to improve our cyber defenses uh, so that we can help the private sector protect themselves against these intrusions. But this is a an ongoing battle. I don't think we're ever going to reach a point where we can say we've solved it. There will always be criminals out there trying to find a way around our defenses. Uh, and that, I think, is the biggest challenge that we face in law enforcement. But we're working cooperatively with the private sector. And our goal is to make sure that we work with you to develop technologies that uh, enable you to defend yourself so you won't need to call on us after crimes have been committed and after you've suffered intrusions and, and data exfiltrations. Uh, with that, I wanted to make sure that we got to some of the audience questions before. And I uh, remember that we're uh, keeping the conversation germane to the topics at hand. <laughs> um, Alex? Sure. I don't know if there's a. No, no, I'm right here. Oh, right over. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Hi, uh, Ed Black, CCIA. Um, <clears throat> you articulated very well the balance and the encryption between security versus, if you will, privacy and security on the other side. Um, and whether there is a solution that is mutually satisfying, I think, is, is a, a very hard question to answer. But hypothetically, if there was a solution that law enforcement found pretty acceptable, we would have a further battle, I think, in the international context. Because while we have a great deal of due process and procedural protections, uh, the world does not in many regimes. And whatever U.S. standard would be developed would, in fact, be transferred globally and would have uh, presumably whatever it was the U.S. part of the protections would, is what would make it sellable, but that standard then becomes a de facto standard for the world, and there are many regimes that would be able to grossly misuse that. Well, I have two responses to that. Uh, the first is really to challenge the premise, because our you know, major corporations are complying now with the laws of the countries where they operate. So you know, there are companies already that are making accommodations uh, because they have to do it in order to do business in countries that have different regulatory schemes than ours. Uh, but the second point I would make is that it's important to recognize this is an issue that actually frequently gets lost in the rhetorical battle over responsible encryption. Uh, I am not uh, calling for the government to possess the keys, you know, to use a colloquial description. I don't think the government should have the ability on its own uh, to decrypt or break into encrypted devices. What we have in mind is uh, a system in which the ability is retained by the manufacturers. So the keys are, are somewhere, but the, they're emphatically not with the government, so that we would require a court order appropriate process, whether they're with a third party, whether they're with the provider. You know, those details, I think, need to be worked out. But 
But the way that we envision this working is not that the government would have the key. The government would not have the ability to break into devices on its own. Uh, Alex Howard from the Sunlight Foundation. Uh, thank you for your anti-corruption work. We care about that a great deal, along your commitment to being more open and transparent with the public. Um, one concern we have seen consistently in the groups of peoples we work with, however, is public access to public information and the legitimate uh, diagnosis of vulnerabilities and security issues in web browsers or devices or hardware. Um, we've seen, um, unfortunately, prosecutors use the discretion they're granted under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act um, in ways that um, concern us, particularly with respect to chilling the act of so-called white hats, uh, people who are trying to diagnose and find problems. The Department of Defense has had a very successful bug bounty that's put, in, put out um, where they're encouraging pu the public to help them find issues. Um, would you support reforms to the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act or offer guidance um, to the nation and to uh, law enforcement officials? They make it clear that um, accessing public information and telling public officials that it's there is not a crime. And moreover, that if journalists document those issues and link to them, that they also should not be prosecuted for effectively telling the public servants that they have a problem they should fix. Alex, that sounds very reasonable. I fear that it's a loaded question, but um, so I don't know what the hidden meaning is, but generally I would say yes, that, that, the, uh, that I, I think I have in fact talked about that DOD model as being an effective model of encouraging people to you know, come forward voluntarily and identify weaknesses. That's how we find them. We want, we want to find them uh, you know, before we're victimized. Uh, and so generally, yes, I, I gather you must have in mind cases where you think somebody really was a white hat hacker who, who was prosecuted. Uh, so I'd have to know the facts of those cases. But as a general matter, I would say, yes, we do. I think the DOD model is effective of encouraging people to come forward in a constructive way when they identify a flaw and not try to abuse or misuse it uh, in order to commit intrusions or exfiltrations. Hi, uh, Amy Stepanovich from Access Now. I actually wanted to ask the flip side of Ed's question, um, which is not only will other countries potentially abuse any capability the U.S. asks for, but other countries are right now using the conversation that's happening in the U.S. and that has been going on for the last few years to justify implementing measures into their own laws, um, where it, whether it's Brazil, Australia, the U.K., China, um, that would limit the amount of security that companies can offer their customers. And in my mind, if there's anything worse than limiting the way users can be secure in one way, it's limiting it in five different ways in five different countries. Um, does the U.S. owe some sort of international obligation to the idea that hacking and corporate espionage and security is the biggest challenge that you're saying faces the digital economy to try to make security better and not make it worse globally? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what you're getting at, but yes, and that's why you know, we talk about it in terms of a balance. Absolutely, uh, we are in favor of encryption. And uh, you know, I, th there are experts who um, argue about whether or not what I have in mind is feasible. And I don't purport to be uh, an engineer, but there are experts who say, yes, it's feasible, that we could uh, and have, in fact, developed systems. Now, there's a symphony system, for example, used by some uh, financial institutions in New York. We do have systems where we retain a high degree of confidence in the security of the system, but nonetheless, uh, we preserve lawful access for regulatory or law enforcement purposes where there's a legitimate need. We have time for two more questions. Yes, right over here. Hi, David Green with NBC Universal. Uh, Mr. Deputy Attorney General, I wonder if you would speak about the priority of your uh, department uh, with the issue of piracy, uh, content theft, and whether that's still an important issue for the Department of Justice. That is still an important issue, Mr. Green, as it was when you were there 25 years ago. Uh, one of my early colleagues at the Department of Justice, uh, absolutely. We haven't talked today about intellectual property, but that is one of our top priorities. In fact, we recently uh, established in, uh, intellectual property coordinators around the world. Uh, we announced, uh, I think, five IP coordinators that we've set up. We've actually detailed 
department attorneys to be stationed uh, in foreign locations to coordinate efforts in those areas because you recognize a lot of this threat comes from abroad uh, and uh, intellectual property is critical to the success of, uh, of American industry. Entrepreneurs uh, deserve to know that we're going to do what we can to protect their intellectual property interests. Uh, and so, yes, we are very concerned about piracy and our department's criminal division uh, does have uh, experts who focus on IP uh, and that continues to be a very high priority for us. One more. Hi, Kathy Gellis. I'm an attorney in private practice. Uh, my question going back to the um, encryption keys that you think would be, I guess, retained by companies. How is a company to respond if they suffer a data breach and the only thing compromised is the key that they've been holding on to? Right, well, obviously your goal would be to prevent that. Uh, and, I, and as I explained to you, I am not an engineer. And so, you know, certainly I, I, I would acknowledge that having a key creates more risk than having no key. The question is, you know, can you uh, you know, create a, can you engineer a system uh, that is sufficiently secure, uh, that there is uh, adequate assurance that those keys are not going to be wrongfully accessed, or that if they were, if somehow you know, the, the provider or the third party custodian lost control of them, that we would have appropriate notice so we could prevent uh, any improper use of them. So you know, that's a challenge that uh, I think is appropriate for engineers, uh, I feel relatively confident based on experts uh, that we've consulted with that it is feasible. And there are in fact systems out there uh, that seem to be reasonably secure but nonetheless you know, do provide the opportunity for uh, responsible access with appropriate uh, judicial supervision. Thank you. I think we're out of time, but thank you very much for joining us today. And for everyone in the room, I'm told to let you know drinks will be in the next room. <laughs> I'm sorry to miss that part. <laughs> Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>